My name is Bruce Mackay from the Health Unit in Mott MacDonald. Um, in the way you treat health, um, you imply that it would be a very good thing to disaggregate your spending by individual MDG goals. Those of us in the health sector would say, oh, please don't do that. <laughs> health is plagued by vertical disease-specific, goal-specific programming and donors who are sort of largely responsible for it. So I, I think you've got to um, take care on that one. And as a second observation, Malawi may spend 16% and Kenya 6% on health, but the main reason is that Malawi has persuaded donors to put its donor money on budget in health. Uh, in Kenya, no health donors are putting any money at all on budget. So I think you, know, you produce a graph like that and draw conclusions and make a big thing about those comparisons, but um, it seems to me it's a misleading graph. Okay. Anybody else want to? There's a couple. <laughs> okay, so somebody else over there. <laughs> Go for it. Anything that's more efficient. Yep. Thank Go you. Over. It's uh, John Garrett from uh, WaterAid. Um, perhaps I could uh, just add my congratulations as well to uh, DFI and, and Oxfam. Yeah, we'll take those as red for everybody. I think we. Uh, we, right we <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it's good for them to hear it, though, yeah, Barry. I'm sure it is. Um, <laughs> Once is enough. <laughs> Um, good. Well, um, my question was really uh, in terms of how we, we had a discussion about governments, and I think uh, Marcus was mentioning uh, the experience of, of one government not knowing its own spending. But, I mean, ha have you found that governments, developing country governments, have essentially been cooperative about this? Have they been welcoming? Um, have, you, have you found that sometimes there's been a lot of hard work in terms of uh, uncovering the, uh, uh, the information which has gone into, into the study? Um, and also, uh, perhaps the international organisations. I know you, you launched at the, uh, at the spring meetings recently, but uh, could you give us a sense? I know there's also alternative tracking systems, which, for example, the World Bank is doing. Can you give us a sense of uh, how they viewed this project and uh, how supportive they've been? Okay, thank you. Great, thank you. Anybody else over there? Yep, gentleman there. This is the last one, and we'll, we'll take some. Uh, just a, a quick Who question. Who are you, sir? Uh, I'm Alan Sparks from Jimkit. We actually built the uh, GSW site. Uh, my, my interest is particularly for the campaigning angle, which is, um, <laughs> which, which is, we can hear you, which is, um, where should the campaigning effort really be focused, especially when there's multiple agencies involved with many different funding streams and different agendas? Okay, good. Good. All three good questions. Who'd like to take the question on uh, disaggregating by individual MDG goals, the health question? Any, anybody? Maybe, maybe Toko would like to, to, to take that one. Did you hear that question about uh, um, looking, at, looking at the MDG goals in silos? And Did you hear that question? Yes, I did. And um, I hope I understood the, the speaker correctly. But I think, um, you know, as, as PHM, we agree that we don't really want to see them in isolation. Um, and that part of, of being able to create that bigger picture um, and be able to say that any kind of underspending on education or will affect health. Any so we we push for intersectoral um, responses, particularly to address the social determinants of health. Um, and I agree that the the Abuja declaration um, as a target is problematic when you're trying to compare what it is different countries are doing with the money, because you might have that public official actually delivering, you know, being very effective with that 6%. So there are some some gaps in how we talk about the NDGs and, and I mean, the critiques are out there. But I, I don't think that that takes away from the fact that it provides a spotlight on the importance of adequately funding um, health and the social determinants of health and moving away, hopefully, from that silo kind of mentality. OK, thank you very much. Um, Liz, let's let's go to you. I mean, how cooperative? Let's take one part of John John Garrett's question. How cooperative do you think the IMF and the World Bank are going to be with this initiative? I mean, you've got some experience of working in Washington. How? Yeah, um, I think that they're very receptive to it. I think they're glad that someone else is doing it. They they may well then step back and say, we don't have to do it. Is the danger? But um, but you know, it's a, we have a job to do to convince them that that's not the case and that they need to be improving on this no they've been they've been they've been very receptive and i think i mean they're, they're very aware of the fact that this is a massive gap 
but it's it's a weird kind of gap that everybody kind of knowed, knew existed, but nobody talked about because you assume that it's such a basic fundamental thing, you can't quite believe that no one else has done this in the past. Yeah. Uh, go on, Marcus. Go yeah. on. Um, Liz, I sort of half agree, but I also think they, they will need enormous pressure on them to do that. I mean, the IMF is being asked to do 100 things any one day. Um, the debt relief initiative, they were, went kicking and screaming into that. But it was only because of the massive international pressure to do something on debt and to then record poverty spending that made any difference. So I, I wouldn't at all underestimate. You know, of course, they're being collaborative. And yes, of course, this is wonderful. That's very different. Will you therefore take it on as something you're going to do globally is a completely different question. What I think is actually part of it is going to be an issue around money. And I think one of the things is just say we need to create a facility which countries that want to produce MDG spending and want help to do that, working with the IMF, can apply for this fund and they will get money to do that because it needs money and it needs effort. And you know, we just haven't got the resources in the room to do it on the global scale that needs to be done if we really are going to do that. But I think that could be, you know, if you do that, I think that could be done. Uh, but also the IMF will say we ain't got the money to do it quite reasonably because in view of other things. So I think you know, money is also part of the problem. Matthew, you wanted to say something quickly? Yeah, I just on, on international organisations, I mean, we, when we were in Washington doing a sort of pre-launch of this, we had very positive meetings with, with everybody, but this is quite right that essentially what they said was we're incredibly happy this is being done. Could you come and give us high-level seminars? Could you yeah. give us training of our country-level staff in how to use these data? Um, and I, particularly on the IMF, they have a system which was analysed in, in a report we did for looking at both Nuria and, and Liz, because they're former save and current save, but that we did for save last year, which was looking at the way the IMF is currently tracking this type of spending in individual country programs. And they have something they call an anti-poverty spending floor, but it's an incredibly weak type of thing that they monitor in a really very different way in different countries. Everything from 1% of the budget to 50% of the budget is, is in that in different countries. Uh, and, and it also, there's, there's no enforcement or, I mean, not that I'm, I'm the last person to be in favour of IMF conditionality, but, but there's no real even monitoring or explanation in the documents of whether it's happening or not. So I think if I had to say what the IMF should be doing, it's that they should at least be monitoring what's happening in their programmes and well, they should have been having doing a dialogue. They should have been doing that for 15 years. Oh, exactly. And, and they, they did. I mean, as Marcus said, at the beginning under HIPIC, there was some discussion about what are you going to spend this debt relief on, yeah. but we seem to have kind of lost that focus a little bit. Before I bring uh, Phil and Nuri and uh, Matthew, I mean, question that um, had we got um, a member of the neoliberal right on the panel, which of course we don't, um, they might be saying that, you know, does it really matter how much is being spent in volume terms? Surely, that, you know, going back to Marx's point, the question is, is this money being well spent? And all you're doing here is measuring inputs. What you're not really measuring is outputs. And that actually, you know, if you're increasing health spending or education spending by 5%, but it's all being blown on wasted projects, then that, that's, it's not really that helpful. What, what, what's, what's your response to that? I think that's a really good point. It comes back to a couple of questions that were put on health as well. Um, I think the reason why we think that the input side is so important is it, well, two reasons. One is, as came out of what Toko was saying, it gives you a chance as civil society and as the people to whom government is supposed to be accountable to get in there at an early stage and say, are you actually <coughs> allocating the money that we think will deliver this? And can you prove to us that it will deliver it? But secondly, and people are already beginning to do this type of analysis with our data, you can use these data to say, are people spending cost effectively, as far as we can see in multiple countries? Compare this with some of them MDG outturns. Mm -hmm. And certainly, I, please don't get the wrong impression, we are not in any sense in this, in this report advocating vertical funds. If anything, that's why we didn't try to split the data up any further, mm -hmm. in spite of some people who want to fund us for the next phase of this work, suggesting to us that we might present money by individual disease. But I do think it's really, uh, to come back to Phil's point about government spending, it is really fundamental that it is governments that are doing this. Uh, you know, with the best will in the world to some excellent service delivery NGOs present in the room, um, and you know, there is a lot of great stuff being done off government. But fundamentally in the end, it's about the countries, as, as Nuria said, it's about having a civilised society where citizens hold their governments accountable. So the government spending is the absolutely vital part of this, and that's why we need to be tracking it and seeing the budget processes where citizens do get at least one chance to hold their okay. governments accountable. Okay. Nuria, uh, Phil, the uh, third question from Alan was, you know, <coughs> where should the campaigning effort be focused? So you've got this lovely new tool, you know, it's up there <laughs> gleaming, you've got it, all this data that you didn't have before. What are you going to do with it? Nuria. I think it doesn't necessarily change. I would turn the question on its head. I think that this provides us better input for campaigning, but it's not that it should 
because we have better data, we should radically change our approaches to campaigning. We, maybe we should radically change our approaches to campaigning, but for other reasons. So I'm not quite sure that, uh, that I see these as a reason to change the approach to campaigning, it's just to em enhance the way we campaign. The only potential, which I've already mentioned initially, is that basically you have um, a more holistic data set that enables to do more holistic uh, campaigning. And to the question of uh, around health and <coughs> civilization, I think you measure uh, what you treasure and you get into traps around measuring and what you care about. And hopefully the next generation of MDGs could potentially look at universal health coverage and then you wouldn't have that problem in, in measuring things that shouldn't be measuring. Mm. <coughs> right. Um, do you want to come in, Phil? Uh, just very. I think I just say a couple of things. I mean, firstly, just in terms of that targets. Uh, you know, what what should be the target? <coughs> you know, civil society is incredibly diverse. This is meant. It's built specifically to really support civil, southern civil society in terms of their uh, information. So it will be used in many diverse ways. I'm sure it will also be used for the international finance is institutions. But we have to accept that. We also have to get it into the format, which I think you've done brilliantly in terms of this website, into a format which is going to be available on mobile technology because that's the technology that so many peop poor people have some access to. And particularly now with the increased amount of uh, you know, fibre optics going into <laughs> sub-Saharan Africa, there's a real opportunity there. The last thing I'd say is just this issue about <coughs> government spending, I can't emphasise enough. If you just take the enormous brouhaha at the moment around the uh, northern Tanzania growth corridor, with this public-private partnership that's supposed to go on and, and bring extraordinary uh, opportunity through the new alliance on, on agriculture. The fact is that we don't know anything, really, about the spending that's going on there by the government or by the transnational corporations that are, that are involved. And until we get some kind of uh, semblance of, of data on that, we're at a loss as to be able to provide praise or criticism and, uh, and critically support the communities who may be very positively affected but unfortunately may also be very badly affected through land grabs, et cetera, that are going to go on in order to make that land available. Okay, good. Let's have some more questions. Uh, if you can make them nice and uh, short and sweet, because we are rapidly running out of time. There's, there's a woman there. Two, in fact. There's one in, in the middle row, one in the front row. So if you can pass it back when you're finished, that'd be great. I will do. Um, my name is Lisa Chambers. I work for the Open Knowledge Foundation on the Open Spending Project. Um, and clearly, I can, I, can, I can tell how much work has gone into this. I'm just wondering... What um, what effort is going to go into feeding back upstream to making sure that the government the governments are improving the data so that it's easier for you to do this next time round? Okay, sounds like one for you, Matthew. In a minute. Hi, I'm Lisa from Save the Children. Mine was actually a similar question. Just asking if you could maybe expand a little bit on your plans for the future. You talked a little bit about expanding, I guess, the breadth of the data in terms of covering more countries. And I just wondered, um, are there plans um, to go into some of the, the depth issues, I guess, that both that TOCO raised, but also in terms of future years, how regularly is it feasible to collect this data, <coughs> I guess, given that spending changes on a yearly basis? Did you have one? Yep, uh, David Hall Matthews from Publish What You Fund. So following up on that, are you going to try and ask uh, countries to automate their publication of data so that you can pull it off rather than have to manually compile every time? And also, um, can we put this into, into a broader context? I mean, if you're a campaigner on the ground, you want to know what the government's spending, but you also want to know what other flows are around. One of the really shocking things that Matthew said is that you know the, the donors are not even telling partner country governments what they're spending in their, uh, in their country, and they're certainly not telling them what they're planning to spend in advance. And I'm wondering if it would be possible to combine government spending watch with um, uh, visualizations of the International Aid Transparency Initiative data so that you can actually look at government spending alongside donor spending, um, where they overlap and where they don't overlap. Good, good. We'll take this one and then... Um um, Anna Thomas, very complimentary to that. Uh, how much did you look at a breakdown of domestic revenue sources, so different types of taxation and non-tax revenue and so on? And if you didn't, was that because you wanted the focus to be on spending? Fair enough, it's the main focus. Or was it because you couldn't get the data for that? Okay. Uh, okay, go on. Sorry, I'm just holding the mic. Are you just holding the mic? <laughs> <laughs> Great. Great. I was going to be nice. <laughs> Unusually for me. Um, <laughs> Matthew, uh, I think there's quite a few questions there. It's probably for you, I would have thought. You know, what, what efforts to, to pass it back upstream to improve the data and 
Um, how regular is it going to be? Um, you know, br in terms of the broad, I I'll ask one of the others about the broader campaign, but uh, is there ch plans to automate the publication of the data and so on? And what about revenue as opposed to spending? What are you doing on that in those uh, fields? Sure, so and they, they'll give me a chance to sort of, they're all about looking forward. Where no, are we going really next, yeah. really? Um, just to, to, to link back to what the question that, that John Garrett put earlier about have governments cooperated? And the answer is, well, yes. And actually, not only have they cooperated, and this work would have been completely impossible without them at all different levels, but also when I initially was waving the draft r of this report around in Washington and pointing out to governments that some of them were appearing in the bottom quarter in terms of their transparency, they all wanted to know what they could do to make it better. Uh, they were really interested by the fact that they, <coughs> were, they were doing less well than some countries next to them. We spoke to the Nigerians about whether they were doing well compared to Ghana. Uh, we spoke to the Kenyans about Tanzania. So th all, all sorts of people that we met were really excited within government about being able to use this to measure themselves against others and do it better. So I think that's a really good sign and that, that links to the sort of vision that we have going forward of how to do this. And uh, what really excites me about the partnership with Oxfam as well is that what we want to do is to bring these different stakeholders together, both at regional and at national level, to partly to provide the type of training that Marcus was, was talking about. I mean, this is not rocket science. This is not really difficult for governments to categorize their spending in this way. It requires will, it requires training, it requires tools, but once that's been done, they can do it. And particularly they can do it if they're then being held accountable by parliamentarians, who we also want to fully involve in this across the world, and by civil society. So the idea, the vision is to bring everybody together at the regional level, say this is what is in here, this is how you can campaign better, this is how you can compile the data better, get them learning from other countries that are already doing it really well, and then move for, that get them to move forward at national level in actually doing it, and, and Oxfam will take the, the, the strong lead at that national level. Um, so yes, we absolutely do want uh, to make sure that this happens at national level uh, in terms of an open knowledge issue, and we've been talking to a lot of the different open budget and open knowledge people about how uh, would you feed this back also into the open, the open processes, if I can call them that, because they tend quite often, and we also had very good discussions with IBP in Washington about the fact that these tend to quite often to be processes where you put a budget document online and then somebody is expected to do the type of work that we've had to do at the national level and it's really, really difficult to do it unless somebody helps you with it or explains to you. So that, I hope that will really help with that as well. Um, absolutely, there are a lot of things we can do in relation to linking to ATI to aid, to particularly, I think, comparing the way that donors and governments categorize things, because often they're very different. And if you're, a, if you're a government aid manager trying to work out what's going on, you really can't work out where the donor's aid money is supposed to be going, let alone whether it's getting there. Um, and revenue, I think, has really come out wherever we've gone uh, as a really strong issue to be incorporating in this. Several potential major funders have said this, we would like the revenue side to be in there. And I think it would probably be incredibly helpful to revenue campaigners across the world. The data are there. We've, we've pretty much got them already. Um, we just haven't, and I'll, I'll use this as my final sentence, we haven't got any money to be able to do it. Oh, this, no. is, this is your, somebody asked how regular this is going to be. We have a strong intention to do this every year, but the, the, we are pretty much out of the money that we've, we've had to do this. So we're, we're going to be in fundraising mode for the next three months to make sure that we get this on a a permanent firm footing and, and can work with all these different partners. Uh, Toko, can I, can I ask you, I mean, what um, one thing will you be able to do now that you couldn't do before as a result uh, of, of, this, uh, of this initiative? And, and, and what one thing would you like to see improved in the future to make your life easier? Um, I think the one thing is precisely the point about being able to see this information in one space. So um, if I'm wanting to work with um, our country circles in Zimbabwe or Zambia um, and South Africa, we have a tool that we can use to start talking about at a national level, what are the commitments, what are not being met, but also at an international level to be or regional and then international level. And obviously within the, within the Southern African region, our concerns are, are around the BRICS. Um, and the role that BRICS is playing, the off-budget issues, the kinds of revenue questions. So this provides, um, so that's the one thing, that it, it just provides a, a holding space um, for being able to talk to people around um, how it is that, that money's not necessarily flowing where we think it should be flowing. Um, where it should improve in the future, I think it's really helping with some of the messaging. Um, often the battle for 
local organizations is to keep track of the, the national, regional, and international um, spaces and movements. Um, for example, South Africa is part of the, the Open Government Initiative, OGP. You know, so how how do we, but yet we've just passed the right, uh, what's been uh, quoted as the Secrecy Bill or the Protection of Information Bill, which then clamps down on access to information. Um, so, yeah, I think I think it's you know it comes back to that point about being aware of campaigning doesn't happen in in, in isolation of of what's happening politically, and so perhaps there could be a way of working with groups that are tracking um, media freedom in in these countries. Are there ways of of assessing media freedom or you know civil and political rights, those kinds of things, um, because that'll give both public officials, I mean, we've been speaking a lot about how the secrecy bill has is going to have an impact on public officials' ability to access information within um, government departments and institutions and to be able to work intersexually. So, um, yeah, that's, I think, something to think about. I mean, it's the complexity of the world we live in. So I think it's important that, that we address that. Okay, thank you. And talk uh, about issues of governance. Yeah. Okay, uh, I'm happy to take a last couple of questions. I realise that this side of the room has been completely um, ignored. So, is there anybody over here who wants to s chirp up? Then please do. Otherwise, I'll ask the panelists to. Okay, you say yeah, quickly. Hi, um, my name is Al Hassan. I work for Oxfam. For me, the interesting thing about this project is the data which shows where donor interests are, and for instance, if you look at water and sanitation, where heavily is donor funded and donor driven, but also the interesting thing about that data is that they are interested in infrastructure development and not committed to um, sponsoring those projects after implementation or when they cut the tape. And that's where sustainability of those infrastructures are under threat. And in the time that we have cut in aid, this sector is going to be in serious problem. So this work is going to strengthen a lot of the work that um, water aid and others have been doing around um, water and improving the transparency and getting national governments interested in it. But working on health and education, I'm happy to see governments have bought in, in that idea, but we need to push them to get a further improvement in health and education. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, there's, there's one gentleman there I think you'd quite like to. Uh, there, um, sorry, Ke uh, Kevin Wilson from Oxfam. I uh, just wanted to know to what effect uh, the, the data looks at kind of internal debt questions. So Torco showed up some of the municipality, Cape Town municipality data, and it was interesting. They, they've got really large budgets, but 20% of that is technically loans, so they never ever spend it. Um, so just whether or not your data sets look at that. I think if we're, well, if, we can, if we're going to do, um, no, exactly. If we're going to do um, spending and revenue, it would be logical to put a couple of lines in about financing as well. We, we don't at the moment. We did analyse that for the overall chapter and pointed out the stuff about domestic debt as well as uh, external debt because a large part of this has been funded from domestic debt as well, uh, which is growing very fast in a lot of countries. But uh, I think we, that's another area we will look at in future. To add to our list of about 100 suggestions, <laughs> I think. <laughs> Anybody else wants to contribute? Right. I, I thought I'd just ask the panel as we sum up. I mean, the, 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 the interesting thing about this um, report is, like all reports, the, the point of them is, is not to sort of describe the state of the world, but to change it. Um, and so I'd like to ask the panelists if they would tell me who they think should really be the focus of this report. Where, who, who, who has most to learn from this report and where should campaigning efforts be directed? Should it be at the IFIs in Washington? Should it be at national governments? Should it be at donors? Should it be at uh, civil society in uh, developing countries? Uh, because clearly there's a limit here and there, you know, there's a limit to what campaigns can do so you have to prioritise. So where, who, who, we, who are you really targeting with this report? Nuria. I'd say probably there are many targets that you could, but on top of my head, I would say uh, those responsible for making spending decisions, so governments and donors. So basically, to your question earlier to Toko, uh, what 
is one of the things that can be done with this report and what this report tells you. Precisely what you were saying before, how do you link progress on MDGs, outcomes, <coughs> to inputs such as financing? You have a range of things, governance, growth, decrease of inequality, that might have had a bearing in progress on MDG. What this report tells you is that finance is very important, attribution is difficult, how much, how far, this is difficult to draw, but finance is very important. So uh, maintain levels of spending uh, and do better spending. Okay. Phil. Well, I think I'd probably say, oddly, civil society, only in the sense that I believe this, da this data now is a <coughs> phenomenal tool of empowerment. And it, in the end, governments receive lots of information, and I take very much the point that governments sometimes don't know themselves. And those are very important instances, but we also know that elites have captured many parts of many states and divert spending towards their interests and away from the interests of the poor. And we're only going to get that change when civil rights, rights organisations and communities come together and start to use this kind of information, along with lots of others, working together to demand that states start to direct the resources of that state towards the common good and towards the alleviation of extreme poverty and the extraordinary impact of the ecological crisis that's going to be upon them. So in the end, it's got to be the biggest tool, for uh, one of the big tools for civil society to use to demand those fundamental changes in government spending that are necessary. Liz? Um, I'd say governments, as long as we don't use it as, a, uh, as just as a method to apportion blame, so we don't just use it as a stick um, with which we can hit governments, but for me they're clearly, they're th I mean, they're, s they're the people making the decisions. Okay. Marcus? In the short term, I say the IMF and bilateral donors because this needs to succeed and it's going to need more support if it's going to really succeed and, and, and really be effective. In the longer term, parliaments. I think we're seeing increasing evidence that parliaments are just the place where budget allocations are being challenged and where they've got evidence that actually in their neighbours this amount is being spent and that's why their education outcomes or their health outcomes are better. <coughs> that is proving, giving them an enormous lever over governments and to actually challenge the spending allocations. Thank you. Toko, who do you think should be um, targeted? Who, which, 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 which group? Um, I think. I mean, I agree with with everyone that's been the, the, the sort of government, the international financing institutions, the donors. Um, but I think I I want to come back to the point of saying, yep, civil society. We need to have a really good conversation about the role of the state um, because we're talking about these these figures in a vacuum about. You know, yes, it's on government budgets, but we have a situation where, for example, in South Africa, many posts are not funded, um, the civil service is so reduced, so we're expecting delivery without the people to do the delivering um, or without the capacity. So, um, yeah, I think it's, it needs to come back to civil society to show exactly where the gaps are, and I think the tool does provide that, and it provides an opportunity to link, for example, the, the Social Justice Coalition example around uh, private-public partnerships for sanitation in Cape Town, they were able to show that, you know, money was not being uh, delivered on and, and uh, contracts were basically looting the, the public sector um, in a situation where there are no public sector workers to provide those who are not being funded to, to deliver those services. And it comes back to Alassane's point about uh, sustainability. So I think, yeah, that it has to come back to to the role that we as activists play in, in reminding those who make the decisions. Okay, thank you. Matthew, last word to you. Yeah, I, well, I agree with everybody because I think the answer is all of the above. Um, that wasn't the question. Though. No, you no, choose. but no, I'm, I'm not going to choose because it may be it may be that in the particular program that Oxfam, Oxfam and us take forward, we put the focus on particular things. But I think there are people in this room who will want to take this in all sorts of directions and people beyond this room. Uh, if, for example, in New York when we launched this at UNDP, the IPU were there. We're very excited to get this out as a tool for parliamentarians across the world. And I don't expect we'll be doing much of that. It'll be them. So my answer is everybody will take this to the people they think it's important to target about it. And for me, what's what's really fascinating, we had, had this happening again today, but it also happened when Kevin Watkins, who's coming here soon as director of ODI, um, helped us launch this in Washington, uh, his current capacity in Brookings. And I must say, he was the person who started this all off by asking us about six years ago, could you put together some education? numbers for about 25 countries um, when he was at UNESCO and for me the really great contributions that we're getting from people are the ones that say to us focus on what explains this 
now, not just these numbers, but actually, and for, for the, the two things that I think I really want to put up there as quickly as possible, apart from the revenue. Uh, one is the bads, okay? So we're talking about spending on the goods, but as we all know, really, really powerful to be able to say to people, you're spending twice as much on defense as you are on health, or you're spending twice as much on debt service as you are on social protection. Um, and secondly, the equity issues. So how do we actually get to that? If we're all gonna be focusing post-2015 on in-country equity, Toko was talking very powerfully about the regional dimension, but there's also all kinds of other inequities. And I, I don't want to get, I don't, I, I don't want us to move, and some other people are already doing that quite well for some countries, to the, to the sort of geo-coded individual transaction data, which for me sometimes just obscures things a little bit, although it can be very useful at individual community level. I want us to really say, okay, what do we need to look at more to explain why the inequity happens and to tackle that together in the post-2015 world? Okay, well, thank you, everybody. I think that's been a really, really fascinating hour and a half, and I'd like us perhaps to think about reconvening in, say, two years' time to find out exactly what, mm. uh, what effect this, uh, this important initiative has had on the, both the quantity and the quality of spending on the MDGs and the post MGG, MDG targets. So can I just say thank you to all the panelists, to Liz, to, to uh, Marcus, to Matthew, to Phil, to Nuria, and to Toko in uh, South Africa. Uh, amazingly, the technology worked perfectly, uh, which, <laughs> given that I was in allegedly in control of it, uh, 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 it was a miracle. Uh, thank you to my panelists. Thank you to everybody in the audience. And uh, I hope you had a good day and, and as, uh, enjoyed it as much as I did. So thank you very much indeed.